grab your popcorn and junior mints because we're going to a special screening of Lamberto Bava's Demons in today's Horror Geek Review. <laughs> Released in 1985, Demons has become one of the quintessential Italian splatter movies. Lamberto Bava's film is perhaps the perfect entry point into the world of Italian horror cinema for American audiences. It's raucous, over-the-top, gory, and a whole lot of fun. Why do fans adore Bava's films so much? Let's find out in the plot breakdown. The film opens on a subway train and with some rock and music from Goblin member Claudio Simonetti. <laughs> Don't look now, but we've got a Dardano Sacchetti sighting. Sacchetti was basically an Italian horror cottage industry in the 80s. After our train ride through the credits, we wind up in a station. See that guy getting off the train? That's director Lamberto Bava. After exiting the train, Cheryl finds herself alone in the station. Or is she? Come on, it's totally normal to run into guys who look like the Phantom of the Opera in the subway station. It's how they get to their underground lairs. This guy is the weirdest Harry Krishna ever. The character was played by director Michele Suave, who did a ton of second unit work for Argento before helming some of the all-time great Italian horror films like Stage Fright, The Church, and Cemetery Man. See, he's not that creepy, he's just handing out free movie passes. We then jump to Cheryl's friend Kathy, who's waiting outside the station. God, Cheryl's late. I bet she's down there talking to strange men in metallic masks again. Cheryl finally shows up. Sorry I'm late, Kathy. I was downstairs talking to a strange man and I... Damn it, I knew it. Now we jump over to the Metropole Theater, which is getting ready for its big night. Fun fact, the Metropole Theater location is still standing in Berlin, and it made a cameo appearance in Konami's original Silent Hill video game. We go inside the theater and discover the decor is... interesting. I love what you've done with the place. Nothing says movie theater quite like an S&M samurai on a dirt bike holding a demon mask. Over in another room, the ticket taker is getting ready for her shift. My hamstrings are like rocks. All that crossfit is really paying off. Outside, Cheryl and Kathy make their way to the Metropole. Hey, you don't think it's going to be a horror movie, do you? Well, it was directed by Lamberto Bava and produced by Dario Argento. So, yeah, probably. Now it's time to meet the victims. We've got Frank and his wife, celebrating their anniversary. He's a real peach. How come I never noticed it? You never notice anything, darling. Here's preppy hunk Urbano Barberini and his buddy Ken. If you don't believe that Urbano Barberini is a stud, just watch him work this coke machine. What a hero. Don't look now, but we've got a blind guy at the movies. He's the smartest guy in the whole bunch, too. He can tell that mask is bad news. Liz. Yes, Werner. Don't touch it. Hooker Geretta Geretta doesn't listen to blind Werner's advice and picks up the mask and puts it on. Nice work. Does this mask make me look sexy? Jaretta, whose character name is Rosemary, is here with another hooker and their pimp, played by Bobby Rhodes. Bobby Rhodes is such a badass that he's going to come back in Demons 2 as a totally different character. He's like Italian horror cinema's version of Mr. T, right down to that awesome facial hair. Rosemary cuts herself taking off the mask. Remember that because, well, you know. Now everyone settles into the theater for the main event. I gotta be honest, this is a pretty good turnout for the test screening of Tyler Perry's newest Medea movie. And then the movie starts. Yeah, here comes 35 minutes of previews. Or not. Man, this movie really starts in media res. Way to set things up. The movie within a movie basically has four people exploring some spooky graveyard for... reasons. McKelly Suave turns up again. He's pulling double duty here. Not only is he the guy with the mask at the beginning, he's one of the stars of the movie within a movie. I hope he got paid double for this. Oh, and he also did second unit direction on Demons. The group explores the cemetery and finds this on a tombstone. They will make cemeteries, their cathedrals, and tombs your cities. Well, that sounds cheery. We then get some more exposition. According to an old legend, Nostradamus was buried here. Nostradamus? Sounds like a rock group to me. Yeah, good one, Nostra dumbass. Kathy's horror movie concerns are then validated. A horror movie? I knew it! I told you this. Hey, I told you, Kathy. Bava and Argento aren't known for their romantic comedies. Not sure why the ticket taker lady is wandering the aisles with her flashlight, but I guess it's so she can prevent teen pregnancies. Hey, hands in your laps and eyes on the screen, kids. Hannah, the girl in this scene, is Fiore Argento, daughter of Dario. 
The ticket taker is totally not cool with teens making out in the theater, but she doesn't seem to mind Liz essentially narrating the on-screen action for Blind Werner. They're going down into a crypt, Werner. Back in the other movie, our intrepid explorers have stumbled on a grave. N. O. S. Sure, Nostradamus. No, no, not Nostradamus. Nosker. We found the grave of Ralph Nosker, of the Poughkeepsie Noskers. Alright, let's wrap it up. Nothing to see here. Our gang then decides to open the grave. Well, screw it, we came all this way. We might as well pop this bad boy open and take a souvenir. You can't be a grave robber if you don't actually rob a grave. Don't look now, but that's the mask from the lobby. The one Rosemary cut her face on. Meanwhile, the book they find inside the coffin is full of practical advice. It says here that demons are instruments of evil. Demons are instruments of evil. Man, there was really nothing old Nostradamus couldn't predict with 100% accuracy, was there? Rosemary's cut starts bleeding again, so she heads off to the restroom, where now it's not just bleeding, but pulsing. This is the best episode of Dr. Pimple Popper ever. Carmen, the other hooker, goes to check on Rosemary. And Rosemary's doing great! Especially if by great you mean growling and barfing up green gunk. Carmen gets some nasty throat wounds for her good deed and stumbles around through some curtains. Rosemary, meanwhile, looks like she just wandered off the set of Michael Jackson's Thriller video. At this point, Warner notices that Liz is gone. Did she go for popcorn and a coke? No, she's getting some action in the back of the theater. Don't look now, but Carmen's throat wound is popping out some green pus. That's probably an infection. Someone better get her some Neosporin stat. Carmen's busy screaming behind the screen, but only Kathy hears her and Ken blows off her observation in typical man fashion. Those screams sound real! Come on, it's the Dolby system! I love that they worked in a plug for Dolby here. Yeah, those screams aren't real, it's just the awesome THX surround sound, baby. Oh, wait, maybe they were really screams coming from behind the screen after all. While that's going on, Rosemary is strangling our lovers. Strangling? You're a demon with claws and crazy teeth. Why are you not rending their flesh? Bobby Rhodes, the compassionate pimp, rushes to Carmen's aid. Hey, babe. What happened? Shit, baby, what happened? Rosemary sure is taking her time killing Liz and her lover. Now kiss. Carmen's not dying. She's becoming a demon. This transformation scene is one of Demon's most infamous sequences. Yeah, we should probably just stand here and watch while this hooker turns into one of the spawn of Satan. I mean, it's probably gonna be cool. I heard Sergio Stivaletti did the effects. While everyone's distracted with that, Liz's lover decides to make an appearance. Hey, don't mind me, I'm just gonna hang around here for a while. In the front of the theater, the transformation is still going. I'm no dentist, but I think she might need braces. Frank gets his throat ripped open, which is a win for his wife, because now she won't have to listen to him be an asshole anymore. Werner finds the corpse of Liz, but before he can properly pay his respects, Rosemary shows up and gouges his useless eyes out in a sequence that would have made Lucio Fulci proud. Then all these Germans flee for the door like there's a free David Hasselhoff concert happening right outside. Too bad all the exits are sealed. That's right, you're gonna watch this entire Adam Sandler movie even if it kills you. And odds are, it will. I love that Bobby Rhodes, the pimp, has become the de facto leader of this group. Well, he's got people management and conflict resolution skills, so I guess we'll listen to him. This lady then meets one of the demons. I wanted to include a scalping joke here, but I couldn't come up with one off the top of my head. I don't know how to explain it. It's just a feeling. The movie's to blame for all this. It's always the movies. Or rap music. Or video games. When do we start blaming grave robbers who stole books of pure evil from Nostradamus's crypt? Don't worry if you're confused about the plot, Bobby Rhodes was clearly paying attention. She put on that mask and scratched herself. Get it? Because of that scratch, she became a demon. Everyone decides to head to the projection booth. If you can stop the movie, you can stop the demonic hordes. It makes no sense, but neither does the theater sealing itself up to keep people locked in with the flesh-eating demons either. Hannah, who you may have forgotten about, is now crawling around on the theater floor. Which isn't just covered with spilled coke and stale popcorn, but probably blood, eye fluid, and demon puke. Hope you brought your hand sanitizer. Inside the projection booth, Bobby Rhodes doesn't have time to figure out the nuances of this mechanical shit. SMASH EVERYTHING! Sounds like a plan. Meanwhile, in another movie, these thugs are driving around doing something. Who the hell are these people, and why are we watching them? Ah, they're just here for the gratuitous product placement. Couldn't they have just put some coke displays at the theater concession stand? Now that our nothing interlude is over, it's back to the theater. Werner may not have eyes anymore, but he's got lots of insights into the plot. It's not the movie. 
It's the theater. Bobby Rose ain't having none of your jibba-jabba. They ain't gonna get me. That's for sure. Hey, Frank's back. I pity the fool that tries to attack Bobby Rhodes. Dude's such a badass that he whips out his switchblade and stabs Frank the demon before sending him over the balcony where Frank can then barf all over Hannah. Nice work. What the hell? Back to these assholes again? Come on, movie! Wait a minute, that's not the kind of coke I thought it was. I'm not sure the Coca-Cola company signed off on this. Bobby Rhodes is like the general Patton of demonic sieges. He's got a plan, he's commanding his forces, they should build him a statue to honor his service. Then this happens. No! Not Bobby Rhodes! Liz likes the dark meat, which is why she goes for the leg. With humanity's greatest hope gone, we're now in the darkest of times. Hannah and her boyfriend finally reunite. She's covered in goo. Yeah, yeah, it's Frank's demon puke. He ralphed all over me. Just in case you needed a break from all the action, we're back to ride around with the punks. We'll just assume this is going to pay off at some point. At least they drove past the theater this time. It's like they're getting closer to actually being in this movie. Oh, and we also learned that Ripper hates it when you spill his coke. Pick it up! Every gram! Back inside, the survivors decide it's a good idea to barricade themselves in the balcony. Hey, we just remodeled this place. Why are you destroying it? Then it's back to the punks. Jesus, I sure hope this is going somewhere. If nothing else, this movie is obsessed with teaching us the best way to clean up spilled cocaine. Everyone regroups back on the balcony and settles down. Are you hungry? I think I've got some stale junior mints in my pocket. Back outside, Ripper and the kids run into the cops. They're trapped in the alleyway until a deus ex doorway appears. Damn it, they're gone. Ah oh, well, let's just sniff their seats and get high. But first, let's harass this homeless... Oh, shit. Hannah and her boyfriend, who've decided to go it alone, wander through the theater's ventilation system. Come out to the coast, we'll get together, have a few laughs. Bad idea. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the biggest cokehead of them all? Don't look now, Nina, but old Scalphead is right behind you. Next, we get one of the film's most iconic scenes. Lamberto Bava may not be the consummate visual stylist his father was, but this is still a really great shot. Everyone hears the gunshots downstairs and assumes help has arrived, so they start tearing down the barricade. George tries to reason with the crazed masses, but they're not having it. Help's coming. Too bad it's three coked out car thieves who are now surrounded by demons. This is pretty much the end of Ripper and his gang. Sure glad we spent a lot of time riding around getting high with them. They were truly integral to the plot. While everyone's clearing the barricade, Bobby Rhodes pops up like a satanic jack-in-the-box. Kathy tries to crawl away from the demon onslaught, but gets caught. She must have been hungry because she snacks on some finger food. Which is good, because the concession stand is closed for the evening. It is sort of interesting that the ticket taker girl is still alive. Oh, my bad. George and Cheryl make it through the barricade, only to discover that someone left the smoke machine running downstairs in the lobby. Ken and Kathy make it too, so the gang's all here. While exploring their surroundings, George finds an air conditioning vent. Man, everyone wants to be John McClane in this movie. Uh-oh, Kathy's weirding me out. Maybe she's a shock. Or maybe she's a demon. Yeah, she's a demon. Ken gives Kathy a great beatdown. And I don't mean it was great like really good, even though it was. I mean he beats her with a great. Kathy's not done, though. She's about to give birth to this creepy baby demon. Look. This doesn't really make sense. Like, where is this demon coming from exactly? But I still love it. The demon baby claws Ken, which means Ken's gonna go full demon soon. George tries to give Ken a pep talk, like he's some sort of half-assed Tony Robbins, only with smaller teeth. The pep talk doesn't work though, so it's time for Chekhov's Katana. Cheryl's in danger, but don't worry. George is here with the dirt bike and the sword to save the day. I feel kinda like we got ripped off in the hero department. Urbano Barberini is nowhere near as cool as Bobby Rhodes. And really, this is pretty much the moment where Demons goes totally batshit insane. I mean, can you imagine the script meeting? Well, yeah, he's gonna ride through the theater on a dirt bike killing demons with a katana. Argento and Bava maul it over. Yeah, that works. George does lose Cheryl though, and then he dumps the bike and has to go all Beatrix Kiddo on the demons on solid ground. If you thought all of this was crazy, you ain't seen nothing yet. This, kids, is what we call a deus ex machina. And the machina in this case is a giant helicopter crashing through the roof of the theater so our heroes can escape. Where is this helicopter from? What is it doing? Why did it crash? 
No one has time for that shit. There are demons to kill and a sequel to set up. Plus, those helicopter blades are useful for pureeing those last few pesky demons. Totally convenient this helicopter not only came with a winch system and a grappling hook harpoon gun, but that none of it was badly damaged after crashing through the roof of a building. If you guessed another demon was coming to mess up this escape attempt, give yourself a screenwriter's credit. After a spirited game of tug of Cheryl, George sends them on their way to the roof. Ah, free at last. Wait a minute, that's McKelly Suave again. George just hangs around while Suave toys with him, but Cheryl harpoons him like his name was Moby Dick with the giant hook they used to get out of the theater. Then they impale him on some rebar. Don't look now though, the demon outbreak wasn't just in the theater, it spread. Like nerd flu at a Star Trek convention. Things look bleak for our heroes as they traverse the demon infested city, and it appears as though they're about to be demon fodder. But a second deus ex machina shows up in the form of a family in a jeep. Two deus ex machinas in one movie. That's gotta be some sort of record. George and Cheryl learn that the survivalist family is heading west, hoping to escape the demons and find a place where humanity is still in control. And in typical Italian horror fashion, that's the end. I love these guys, but none of them really knew how to end a movie. Man, you guys didn't really think we were getting out of here without one more demon, right? Yeah, Cheryl got scratched or something along the way and goes all hellspawn. But little Giovanni Frezza, a Fulci film veteran, ices her before she can do any damage. And now we get the full-on credits. Demons went on to spawn one legit sequel, Lamberto Bava's Demons 2, and a slew of in-name-only follow-ups. Breaking down the chronology of the Demons franchise is pretty much an entire video of its own, but Lamberto Bava's The Ogre, Michele Suave's The Church, The Sect, and even Cemetery Man, and Umberto Lenzi's Black Demons all were christened Demon sequels at one point or another. None of them had anything to do with Bava's two official Demons entries, but, you know, marketing. Argento and Bava did tease a new 3D remake of Demons back in 2016, but nothing ever came of it. I'm not generally a fan of remakes, but the idea of redoing or updating Demons is probably something I could get behind. But even if we never get another Demons movie, we'll always have this one. And that's more than good enough for me. How about you? Have you seen Demons? Would you want a remake? Let me know in the comments section below. And while you're down there, why not like this video and subscribe to the channel? I've got a plus one pass to a movie screening at the Metropole and I want to take one of you guys along with me. Oh, and check out some of my other videos. You'll find a link to another demon movie, Night of the Demons, here on the screen. I'll see you over there. Don't leave me hanging. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters.